Where was the Garden of Eden? This is an age-old question, and although we can probably never know for certainty of its location, I believe there are verses in the scriptures that may give us a rough estimate. With that being said, I'm going to explain where I believe the Garden of Eden is located based on these scriptures. For this video, I won't go fully in depth. I'll only provide information for you to ponder on. In the future, I'll make a more in-depth video. But with all that being said, let's begin. There are important elements we should be looking for. One, the general location. Is the garden itself Eden or is it somewhere in Eden? Two, if the garden is in Eden, then is it in the north, south, east, west? Three, are there any key locations that stand out, such as names of rivers, trees, mountains, etc.? Four, what are the natural resources around these key locations? Five, where are these key locations and natural resources found today? And lastly, six, is there any spiritual symbolism and parallels that we can match Eden with when it comes to modern locations. We must answer these questions if we are to understand the Garden of Eden's location. Therefore, let's begin our investigation with scriptures. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. According to the scriptures, the garden was eastward in Eden. This is a good start because we know we're not looking northwest or south. We have a general location to look at. Let's return to scripture and see what else it says. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and the onyx stone. Now we have environmental factors and natural resources that can help us map out the garden's location. A river went out of Eden, and that river watered the garden. This same river parted into four rivers. The first river name is Pishon. The Pishon River surrounded the whole land of Havilah. The land of Havilah has gold, bdellium, and onyx stone. All of these natural resources can be found in Eastern Africa. Take Bedellium as an example. Bedellium has been found in Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Bedellium is part of the Camiphora africana trees growing in Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Sub-Saharan Africa occurring widely over Sub-Saharan Africa and Angola, Botswana, Burkina Faso, Chad, Eswatini, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Mali, Mauritania, Mozambique, Namibia, Niger, Senegal, Somalia, South Africa, Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Where bdellium is found in East Africa, you can also find gold. Gold is very abundant throughout Eastern Africa. Gold is actually one of the major resources that's being mined in Eastern Africa today. Onyx stone is found close to East Africa in Yemen and Madagascar. I would say based on natural resources, the land of Havila is Eastern Africa. This can be solidified by the fact that the name or word Havila is actually the name of Cush's son. Cush was the son of Ham, and it's believed that the descendants of Cush settled in Eastern Africa. Based on the natural resources found there, this would seem to be true. Genesis chapter 10 verse 6 through 7 And the sons of Ham, Cush, and the son of Cush and Havila, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Eastern Africa, which is where Bedellium is found and which is where 
Havila is said to be. I would say that the land of Havila is Eastern Africa. Therefore, the Pishon River surrounded the land of Eastern Africa. But now let's return to the scriptures and see what else is said. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. The Gihon River encompassed or surrounded the land of Ethiopia. In Hebrew, that word is Cush. Now this is interesting in another key because Cush was the son of Ham according to the scriptures and there was an ancient kingdom under the same name called Cush. The ancient kingdom of Cush was in modern day Sudan and Cush also had another name called Nubia and Nubia was also known for gold. According to Britannica, Cush also spelled Cush, the southern portion of the ancient region known as Nubia. The kingdom of Kush, according to World History Encyclopedia, Kush was a kingdom in northern Africa in the region corresponding to modern day Sudan. The larger region around Kush, later referred to as Nubia, was inhabited circa 8000 BCE but the kingdom of Kush rose much later. The Kerma culture, so named after the city of Kerma in the region, is attested as early as 2500 BCE, and archeological evidence from Sudan and Egypt show that Egyptians and the people of Kush region were in contact from the early dynastic period in Egypt, circa 3150 through circa 2613 BCE onwards. According to the book, Daily Life of the Nubians, the ancient Egyptians referred to a region located south of the third cataract of the Nile River, in which the Nubians dwelt as Kush, most often in the phrase Val Kush or Wretched Kush. And according to the book, The Nubian Past and Archaeology of Sudan, the name of Nubia has long been used to describe Egypt's southern neighbor. Historically, other names have been applied to this region and its inhabitants, Kush being a widely used term in the ancient world as well as Ethiopia. Now according to the history of ancient Nubia by the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. Some have linked it to Nub or Nubia, the ancient Egyptian word for gold. And according to Jewels of Ancient Nubia, the term Nubia comes from the Egyptian word Nub meaning gold. And according to the Kingdom of Kush Sub-Saharan African Rulers of the Nile by Thought.com, the roots of the Kushite kingdom emerged near the third cataract of the Nile River in the third millennium BC, developed from cattle pastoralists who are known to archaeologists as the A group or pre kerma culture. The Kushite kingdom is mentioned as Kush or Kush in the Old Testament, Ethiopia in ancient Greek literature, and Nubia to the Romans. Nubia may have been derived from an Egyptian word for gold, Nub. The Egyptians called Nubia Ta Seti. And according to the book Ancient Nubia, it has been suggested that the name comes from the ancient Egyptian word Nub, meaning gold, since the area was an important source of gold in Pharaonic times and later. But it is not the name the ancient Egyptians used for the country, and the suggestion may be fanciful. The Egyptians frequently called the area Taseti, land of the bow, or Kush, probably a name used by the inhabitants themselves. And according to Science Direct, Gold of the Pharaohs, 6,000 years of gold mining in Egypt and Nubia, most probably the name Nubia is alliterated from Nu, 
the ancient Egyptian word for gold. I would say that the land of Kush is southern Egypt to Sudan. Therefore, the Gihon River surrounded the land of northeastern Africa between the Nile River and the Red Sea. But now let's return to the scriptures and see what else is said. And the name of the third river is Hiddekel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. What's fascinating about these four rivers, the Pishon, Gihon, Hiddekel, or Tigris, and the Euphrates, is that these four rivers are basically the rivers of the Fertile Crescent, the Nile River and Mesopotamia. The Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, and the Nile Valley are important locations for the genesis of the Hebrew people. Both locations are also the home of the first Afro-Asiatic civilizations such as ancient Egypt and the Akkadian Empire. According to National Geographic title Fertile Crescent, it reads, fed by the waterways of the Euphrates, Tigris, and Nile rivers, the Fertile Crescent has been home to a variety of cultures, rich agriculture, and trade over thousands of years. Named for its rich soils, the Fertile Crescent, often called the Cradle of Civilization is found in the Middle East. Also, from history.com, titled Fertile Crescent, it reads, The Fertile Crescent is the boomerang-shaped region of the Middle East that was home to some of the earliest human civilizations, also known as the Cradle of Civilization. This area was the birthplace of a number of technological innovations, including riding the wheel agriculture and the use of irrigation. Now what's perhaps the most fascinating thing about the Nile Valley and the Mesopotamian rivers is that they sit perfectly between the land of Israel. Israel is also part of the Fertile Crescent. The Levant or Israel is actually the birthplace of the first proto-Afro-Asiatic speakers also known as Natufians. Natufians will be the first agriculturalists, farmers, pastoralists, and they will be the ones to domesticate the sheep and goats, etc. It's even believed that the Levant is the birthplace of proto-Semites from these Natufian populations. According to Cambridge University, given the modern distribution of Semitic languages over the area in question which belong to the larger Afro-Asiatic family, it seems appropriate to suggest that these first farmers of the Levant and their Mesolithic predecessors, including the Natufian culture, were speaking a proto-Afro-Asiatic language. It may be that proto-Semitic continued to develop within the Levant and Syria area since both Ebalites and Akkadian early Semitic languages are there attested early, the farmer around 2400 BC. According to the book The Winds of Change, the Natufians were a Neolithic culture that extended from modern day Israel to southeastern Turkey and around 11,500 years ago they were among the first peoples to start cultivating grains and domesticating cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs in this landscape, which varied from Mediterranean woodland to scrubland and steep. And according to the paper, the Natufian culture in the Levant threshold to the origins of agriculture, it reads, data have led to the Recognition that a Natufian homeland existed in the central Levant and that the Natufians were secondary foragers and perhaps the earliest farmers. This information led to the recognition that the Natufian culture played a major role in the emergence of the early Neolithic farming communities or what is known as the agricultural revolution. 
Now I'm not saying that the Natufians would represent Adam and Eve, but I do find it interesting that the Natufians seem to parallel the early chapters of Genesis. As an example, Cain being an agriculturalist and planting crops, whereas Abel being a pastoralist and raising sheep. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. The parallel between the Natufians and the early chapters of Genesis is fascinating. But I'm not saying that the Natufians are Adam and Eve. But rather, the Natufians settled in the same region as the pre-flood Garden of Eden, because I believe that the Garden of Eden was in Israel. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hiddekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. The landmass of Eden is Africa, but east of Eden is the Middle East, specifically Israel, which is also the future promised land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. End time scripture even seems to allude to the fact that Israel will be like the Garden of Eden, and that the Garden of Eden will be restored. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Chapter 47. Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed. And everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Enjidai even unto Enegleim. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. Summer and in winter shall it be, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. Chapter 22 And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I believe that the pre-flood Garden of Eden is in the same place where the restored Garden of Eden will be, which is the promised land given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Furthermore, I also believe that the same way that the waters flowed in the restored Garden of Eden is the same way that the pre-flood waters flowed. Two branches of the river will flow to the Nile River and the Red Sea, 
The Nile River is the Pishan River and the Red Sea is the Gihon River, whereas the other two rivers would flow to Mesopotamia, Hittakel, also known as Tigris, and the Euphrates. But all four rivers are connected by the Jordan River to form a single stream. With all that being said, what was the Garden of Eden like? And what was the pre-flood world like? Was it similar to our world today? Or was it completely different? The following video will deal with this very question. Copyright disclaimer. Under Title 17 USC Section 107, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. New theory now that says maybe a lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. A lack of oxygen? Why would they say that? Well, they had a big symposium in 1993. A bunch of scientists got together to study the apatosaurus. And they said, folks, we've got a problem. An 80 foot apatosaurus had nostrils the same size as a horse. How is an 80 foot animal going to get enough air? few nostrils the same size as a horse. He'd be sucking so hard trying to get a breath, it set him on fire from the friction from the wind whistling in there. <clears throat> they couldn't breathe. Well, apparently they did breathe because bones of dinosaurs are found all over the planet, even in Antarctica and Alaska. I mean, dinosaurs lived everywhere, okay? So how could an 80-foot animal get enough air? Well, today he probably couldn't, not to get 80 feet long. But I think before the flood came, they had this canopy of air or of water or ice that would increase air pressure. Plus, they had richer oxygen. You know, when they drill into the amber, how many saw the movie Jurassic Park, you know, where they drilled in to get the mosquito blood out? Sometimes in amber, which is petrified tree sap, they find air bubbles in the amber. When they analyze the air bubbles, they find out they're 50% more oxygen than we have today. Today, we're breathing 21% oxygen. Amber bubbles have 32% oxygen. Do you know if you lived in a world with double the air pressure and 50% more oxygen, just breathing would be exciting. Adam would go, wow, that was fun. Hey, Eve, let's do that again. Ready, go. The earth had more oxygen in the past than it does now. Now, you kids are going to be told in textbooks that the earth had no oxygen at the beginning when life was evolving, called a reducing atmosphere. That is baloney. We cover all that about uh, video four, about how life began. <laughs> could not have evolved with oxygen or without oxygen. But if you double the air pressure and increase oxygen, not only does your hemoglobin take on oxygen like it's supposed to, <clears throat> your plasma will get oxygen saturated, which means you could run hundreds of miles without getting tired. Adam and Eve didn't need a car. They could run to grandma's. Only they didn't have a grandma. Or a mother-in-law, by the way. That's why it was paradise. But, um, <laughs> actually, my wife had a great mother-in-law. But uh, I think before the flood came, <clears throat> I think things were a whole lot different. With increased oxygen, you would heal up much faster. How many of you remember baby Jessica that fell into the well in Texas? 18 months old, her left leg slipped down in a pipe, her right leg came up behind her, and she did the splits as she slid down inside an 8-inch steel pipe. She went down 20 feet and was stuck there for two and a half days. They tore up the whole neighborhood trying to get that kid out of that well. It was on the news about every 15 minutes. Remember that? You know, baby Jessica is still alive. When they finally got her out of that well, lots of her body had turned black from lack of circulation. Her right leg was totally black because it had been twisted around and stuck in her face from behind, doing the splits. One of the doctors said, we have to cut her leg off immediately. Another doctor said, hey, before we cut the leg off, let's just try putting her in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. You know what? Hyperbaric oxygen. They put Jessica in one of these chambers, filled it up full of pure oxygen, and pumped it up to double normal pressure. Within a few hours, her leg turned pink. They restored circulation. They saved her leg. They did have to amputate half of her little toe, okay? They couldn't save that. It beats losing a leg by a long shot. By the way, do you know what you call a girl if one leg is shorter than the other? Eileen. Just a little bit of trivia there, okay. Uh, 
There's a La Chamber in Pensacola, Florida. This one in Pensacola holds 30 people in an emergency. A lot of hospitals are getting these hyperbaric chambers. Does UT Medical Center have a hyperbaric chamber? They do? You know how big it is? Is it one or two or three person or one person? Okay. West Germany is treating stroke patients with hyperbaric oxygen, getting incredible recovery from strokes. In England, they're treating multiple sclerosis. They treat all kinds of diseases with hyperbaric chambers. In India, they're treating leprosy, getting incredible results. Here's a kid being treated for cerebral palsy with hyperbaric oxygen. Doctors have discovered if they add more oxygen during surgery when the person's under anesthetic, only half as many patients get infections and only half as many people get nauseated just by giving the sleeping patient more oxygen. Interesting. There's a chamber in New York that treats autism with hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric therapies use as healing tool grows, article says. Here's a single person chamber. Did you know the Dallas Cowboys have a hyperbaric chamber? Why would professional sports teams want a hyperbaric chamber? Well, because they've discovered their injured players will heal twice as fast. See, if you're paying the guy $1,000 a minute to go play with a ball, you want him out there playing with the ball. Okay, earning his $1,000 a minute or whatever they get. Here's a Zach, somebody from the Dolphins. It says, about three times a week during the season, Zach chills out for an hour or so in a hyperbaric chamber. A 12 by 4 bag inflated with pure oxygen that helps the body heal and promotes a feeling of well-being. Hmm. You can get your own hyperbaric sleeping bag if you want. A friend of mine in Oregon has a hyperbaric chamber. Here's my son running the camera back there and his wife and I at an oxygen bar in Alaska. Not a bar where you drink alcohol. I've never had alcohol in my life, okay? But you sit down to eat lunch and you breathe pure oxygen. You pay them five bucks and you breathe pure oxygen while you're eating lunch. And when you get done, you, man, you feel like going shopping again. It's a conspiracy, I can tell you right now. The whole thing's a conspiracy to get you to spend more money. Okay, but then you feel great. My friend in Oregon has a hyperbaric chamber. I was out there. He said, Brother Hovind, would you like to try it? I said, uh, yeah. He put me in there, gave me a book to read. He said, I'm going to shut the door and pump it up to triple normal pressure. They, they use the diving terms. You're going to dive to 90 feet. Well, you're sitting right there in the chamber. You don't go anywhere. But it's like scuba diving to 90 feet. He said, now... I'll let you out in about an hour. I was in there breathing pure oxygen for an hour, reading my book, under triple normal pressure. When he let me out, he said, how do you feel? I said, I feel like running around the world. This is incredible. Now, how many of you old timers, your get up and go, done, got up and went? You know what I'm talking about? You know, yeah. <laughs> Most exciting thing you can think of is taking a nap Sunday afternoon, right? Well, Man, in the pre-flood world, if they had to double the air pressure and increased oxygen, you would just be full of energy all the time. There's a guy in Japan who started raising tomato plants with pressurized carbon dioxide. You know, plants breathe CO2, not oxygen. His tomato plant grew faster than normal. When it was two years old, it was nine, uh, 14, 16 feet tall and produced 900 tomatoes. They moved it to a shopping center and built scaffolding to hold the branches up. They said, you know, this thing might produce 10,000 tomatoes. This is one tomato plant. It ended up growing 40 feet tall and producing 15,000 tomatoes off one plant. They were, it was a cherry tomato plant, but they were, his tomatoes were coming off baseball size, off of his. A guy in Iowa got curious, you know, why do the birds start chirping an hour before sunrise? He found out the chirping of the birds is a certain frequency that opens up the stomata on the leaf cells. You know, the leaf, if you look underneath with the magnifying glass, it's got these little holes in there that open up to let the CO2 come in. It wakes the leaf up in the morning. Well, he discovered that this frequency is found quite a bit in classical music. So he started playing Beethoven and Bach and Chopin to his cornfield. His neighbors thought, you know, un poquito loco a la cabeza, you know. He's about a half a bubble off a plum or something, you know. But cheese done fell out of his sandwich. Anyway, they thought he was nuts until his corn grew 15 feet tall. He played it to his squash plants, and they grew, they grew five squash per leaf instead of one. He played it to his black walnut tree, and it grew twice as fast as normal. He, his potatoes got t double or triple normal potato size. His cantaloupe were the size of soccer balls. He called it Sonic Bloom. There's a good magazine called Creation Illustrated. I've got one on the table down here. There are two Creation magazines, regular Creation magazine, that's a good one, and Creation Illustrated. 
But you can go to my website, just click on the dot to go to Creation Illustrated. They'll send you a free copy to try it. It's 20 bucks a year if you want to subscribe. But if you go to my website, Dr. Dino, you can click on that and get a free copy. It's, there's an article in there in one of the past issues about this uh, sonic bloom, which is really incredible, sitting on the table down here. Sign up for it on drdino.com. Canopy of water would increase air pressure, which would make things behave very differently. It makes insects grow much bigger. See, insects are limited on size by based on the amount of oxygen they can get. Insects that live in oxygen-rich waters get a thousand times heavier than those that don't. It has to do with the surface area to volume ratio. Without boring everybody for a half hour, the larger an insect gets, it has more skin, but not compared to its volume. The surface area compared to its volume ratio drops off, as you can see on the chart here. So as an insect gets larger, it can't, doesn't have enough skin because insects breathe through their skin. But giant insect fossils have been found, like this dragonfly with a 50-inch wingspan. How'd you like to hit one of those at 70 miles an hour? You take the bug deflector and the hood right off and join you in the front seat. Big dragonflies been found fossilized on this planet. Today they get four or five inches long, you know, not very big. Pre-flood they were huge. Cockroaches get pretty good size today. We raise them in our museum in Pensacola, the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. But did you know giant cockroaches have been found? 18 inch long cockroach fossils. You didn't call Orkin in those days, you called the National Guard to come exterminate the house, okay? Giant fossil centipede, eight and a half feet long, was found. Grasshoppers, two feet long, have been found fossilized. You can make a meal out of those. Tarantula with a three-foot leg span, fossil. Sixty-foot cattail fossils have been found. A donkey nine feet high, from Texas, of course. Everything's bigger in Texas, okay? Giant sloths obviously lived on the planet. Now you're going to be told that was millions of years ago. No, it wasn't. It was just before the flood came. Buffalo were found with horn spans up to 12 feet. Elk with 12-foot antlers. Some of you deer hunters are thinking, wow, that'll look good on the wall. How many of you go out and try to shoot Bambi's daddy? Come on, be honest, okay? There we go. Good, good. And eat them too. You know, fossil kangaroos have been found 10 feet tall. And fossil wombat, the size of a mini. Here's a fossil of a guinea pig that was 1,500 pounds. That's a big guinea pig. Birds have been found 13 feet tall. Here's an uh, elephant bird egg. The one behind it's an ostrich egg, which is also huge. <laughs> they find fossils of prehistoric goose that stood as tall as an elephant and weighed half a ton. How would you like to have that for Thanksgiving dinner? Tell Tiny Tim about that goose. <laughs> yeah. Fossil beavers have been found eight feet long. Here's a guy holding a beaver jaw from about a seven or eight foot beaver. There's a six foot beaver found in Ohio. See, if you have bigger trees before the flood, you would need bigger beavers to chew them down. Mm -hmm. God kept everything balanced in those days. Salamanders today get from five to eight inches long, typically. Did you know fossil salamanders have been found that are six feet long? Increasing air pressure means more gas gets into the water, and fish have to breathe in the water through their gills. So if you had more gas dissolved in the water from greater air pressure, now the fish can get bigger. And you can get a lot more fish per cubic mile. Today, if a shark has a tooth about an inch long, it indicates the shark was probably about 15 feet long. Did you know fossil sharks' teeth are found, indicating sharks used to get 80 feet long on this planet? Can you imagine an 80-foot shark? The movie Jaws had a 25-foot shark. You'd have to use Jaws for bait to catch one of these megalodons. Dr. Baugh is raising piranha in an aquarium with a stronger magnetic field around it. Just increasing the magnetic field is doing something because his piranha are four times larger than normal. When he raised fruit flies in a hyperbaric chamber, they lived 10 times longer than normal just by increasing air pressure. If you combine the air pressure and the filtered sunlight and the stronger magnetic field, you'd probably get Garden of Eden conditions. They probably lost at least those things, maybe, maybe, at least those three things. Maybe more uh, things have been lost since then. Turtles got pretty good size. That's a big turtle uh, on the left. Oysters were found two miles above sea level. Eleven foot oysters 
weighing 600 pounds, two miles above sea level in the Andes Mountains. Genesis 1.30, and we'll quit here. God said to every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth upon the earth, when there is life, I've given green herb. You mean everything that lived on earth ate plants before the flood came? That's exactly right. You say, Brother Hovind, look at those teeth. Now that's a meat eater. No, that's a panda bear. You know, sharp teeth do not indicate meat eating. There's a deer in China. It's called the water deer. You can look it up on the internet. Water deer. Has teeth like a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> you look at a saber tooth. Oh, wow, that's a meat eater. No, that's a vegetarian, okay? How about that one? Now, that's a meat eater. Look at those sharp teeth, Hovind. No, I'm sorry, that's a fruit bat. How about that one? That's a meat eater. No, that's a vegetarian monkey. There's a lion that refused to eat meat all of its life. Lived to be 11 years old. It was used in movies as an actor. Finally got killed in an accident on the movie set. Refused to eat meat of any kind. In conclusion and summary, I believe that the Garden of Eden was located in the Promised Land, making the Promised Land important since the beginning to the end. A land given to Adam, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to the Israelites, and ultimately the Messiah. The pre-flood world was one supercontinent, and it was a paradise. It was unlike anything that we see today in the modern world because of how the environment back then worked. With that being said, Shalom and have a great day.